Well, once again, we are thankful for another Lord's Day, an opportunity to turn our attention to God's Word. So why don't you go ahead and grab your copy of the Bible and turn to Philippians. And as you're turning there, I just want to give a, just a word of thanks for all of those who participated last week in uh, the video production. I was able to watch the video produced for Grace Church of the Valley um, that they showed there this morning, and it was just a fantastic display of God's goodness and grace to our church and the connection and partnership between our two churches. In fact, I'm going down there this week, uh, midweek, to preach uh, at their summer fest, and so I covered your prayers as they have a huge outreach uh, there at Grace Church of the Valley, so please uh, keep me in mind as, as we go down there uh, to preach. But I am thankful for an opportunity to begin our own uh, Summer in the Psalms, and I want to remind you that tonight is a potluck, and so if you're going to come hungry, make sure you come hungry with also a plate of food. So there will be other people who are hungry, and you can feed them. You want to make sure that you connect either on Slack or talk to Amy or those in the hospitality team to make sure that you are bringing food for uh, the people that are involved tonight. Well, I uh, want to begin with this question as we turn our attention to God's Word. And the question is this, what is influencing you? What's influencing you? You know that over the last decade, uh, we've seen just a, a tremendous explosion as it relates to social media. More than 3.4 billion people actively use social media. And just to help you with the math, that's half, about half the world that is on social media. You can't be on social media today without being influenced in some way or, or fashion. In fact, there is a whole category of people on social media known as influencers. Webster's defines an influencer as a person who inspires or guides the actions of others. And in the social media world, an influencer is someone who has the power to affect your purchasing thoughts or your lifestyle decisions. Influencers are apparently experts in directing your thoughts and actions. Our family, we watched a show not too long ago, and the show was about a magician. And he had a little experiment, and so what he did was he brought three really popular influencers into basically his laboratory and conducted a little of experiments. It was two girls and one guy, and those three influencers, they combined for over six million followers. And so he wanted to put them to the test and see which of the three were the most influential, who's going to hit the little love button or the like button on their social media pages. And so this is what he did. He gave them five minutes gave them a bunch of props, gave them a bunch of options for rooms, and told them you have five minutes to create some sort of scene so you could snap your selfie, and let's see who gets the most likes. And so there they go. They go off running. They got their props. They chose the room. They take their selfie. Now, what's fascinating about this whole experiment is they came back, and they were confident that what they chose was the best thing. And interestingly... They all chose the same prop, the same room, they had the same caption, and they had the same hashtag. You say, well, maybe it's because they just have great minds and they're that influential that they all think alike. But the reality was that the magician had uploaded in their minds subliminal messages before they went off and did what they did. You see, they thought they were being creative. They thought they were acting independently. They thought they were unique influencers. But in reality, they were just the ones that were being influenced. And this is how advertising works. In fact, according to digital marketing experts, most Americans are exposed to around four to 10,000 ads every day. So again, the question is, what's influencing you? It was John Stott who famously said, the battle of the Christian life is the battle for the Christian mind. And the Bible leaves no doubt that people's lives are the product of their thoughts. Someone has well said, you are not what you think you are. What you think 
That's what you are. And Proverbs confirms this idea. In Proverbs 23, 7, we read this. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. You see, where your mind goes, that's where your manner of life follows. And growing up, I had several people tell me things like, hey, Dom, you know what? You are what you eat. And that is true in a lot of ways. So I guess I'm like a taco and a burrito, right? Because that's what I love to eat. And it's showing now more days. But I wish someone would have told me, Dom, you know that you are what you think. If I would have realized that at a younger age, I think I would have spared myself from a lot of heartache and trouble. But Jesus says this in Matthew 15. He says, verse 18, But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those are what defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and sexual immoralities and thefts and false witness and slanders. And you think back to Jesus' famous sermon on the Sermon on the Mount, where he taught that the genesis of our sin is not in our actions, but it's actually in our minds. Commandments are first broken in our thoughts. And so he said, you can be guilty of murder without ever lifting a finger. Just harbor hatred in your heart, and it's like committing murder. And you could commit adultery without ever jumping into a bed with someone other than your spouse. Just go ahead and meditate and muse on sexual things in your mind. Listen, church, what you think matters, and oftentimes it matters much more than you think. D.A. Carson said this, The real measure of individuals lies in what they think, not in what they own or in how well they deploy their gifts or even in what they do, but in what they think. If you think holy thoughts, you will be holy. But if you think garbage, you will be garbage. That's exactly why, church, we have to proactively discipline our minds. We need to practice biblical, Christ-centered, self-imposed thought control. You say, why? Well, because the degree to which you control your thoughts determines the development of your holiness and your Christ-likeness. Now, over the past couple of weeks, as we've been looking at Philipp- or, I'm sorry, yeah, Philippians chapter 4, we've been learning that God's desire for us is to be spiritually sa- stable. We're to be spiritually stable saints. And the last time we uncovered a threat to our spiritual stability, and that threat has to do with worry or anxiety or fear, all of which start where? In the mind. Anxiety, we defined, is that mental tug-of-war that begins when bad thoughts start to pull on good thoughts, and in your mind you're being strangled. And you'll remember that we said that the antidote for anxiety is to replace our worry with what? With worship. To turn the panic into prayer, which really is just another way of saying that we need to refocus our attention and our thoughts. We need to make sure that our minds are fixed and filled with all that is good and holy and righteous and just and pure. And another way to say that is we need to fix our minds on Jesus. But listen, we won't be able to do that. You won't be able to do that if you are not in Christ. The ungenerate mind won't be able, by its own willpower, to think godly thoughts. So before there's any reformation of the mind, there must be a regeneration of the heart. There must be A rebirth. So if you're a non-Christian here this morning, my prayer for you is that you would open your heart to what the Bible says and that you would seriously consider how your thought life influences your whole life. You see, the Bible is very clear that you and I, we live in a sin-stained world. Sin is a problem, but sin is in us, which makes us the problem. We are sinners. And the Bible's very clear how this sin impacts our thinking. When you start flipping through the pages of the Bible, you'll see that it describes our mind's sinfulness in a variety of ways. The Bible says that we're confused. It says that our minds are closed. It says that we have an evil and restless mind. It says that our minds are rash and deluded. Let me just give you a few sample verses 
so you can see what the Bible says about the unregenerate mind and its madness. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 says this, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, and it is not even able to do so. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 14 says, But their minds were hardened. That's a description of the unregenerate mind, a hardened mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 reads this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelieving, so they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of God, who is the image of Christ. The unregenerate mind is a blinded mind. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3 reads this, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of the Lord Jesus Christ, and with a doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited, understanding nothing, but having a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. So look, the only way to overcome a hostile, hardened, unbelieving, depraved mind is for you to embrace the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful to save, to sanctify, and to transform our minds. And when our minds are transformed, so are our emotions and our will and our actions. You see, you'll never be able to just get rid of worry in your life. That does not work. Just stop worrying does not work. Just stop sinning doesn't work. No, our thoughts need to be substituted. Substituted with Scripture-saturated, Spirit-sanctifying, Christ-consuming thoughts. Or Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 12. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Minds. So that you will prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so over and over again, as we go to the Scriptures, we learn that our minds need to be strengthened. Our minds need to be renewed. Our minds need to be submitted, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, Paul tells us. We must expel what is false and wicked. And the best way to expel evil thoughts, sinful thoughts, lustful thoughts, godless thoughts, is to exchange them with something infinitely more glorious. And that's what Paul's instructions are for this morning. His instructions here in verse 8 and 9 of Philippians chapter 4, he basically reduces or the entire Christian life into two basic categories. In verse 8, he says this, you must think. Because thinking about things that please and honor the Lord will please and honor the Lord. And in verse 9, he says you must practice doing the things that most please and honor the Lord and so this peace of God that we talked about last week, this peace of God that guards our hearts and minds, it, it comes through prayer, but it also comes through positive thinking. Positive thinking. And when I say positive thinking, uh, we're not talking about the self-help psychobabble stuff. We're not talking about Oprah or, or the Joel Osteen, just positive mindset. No, we're talking about the kind of thinking that's governed by the Word of God. The Word of God tells us that we can counteract anxiety by offering up thankful prayers and petitions and supplications and requests. We can bring our anxious thoughts before the throne of God. And the Bible says, the Bible promises that we will experience a peace that surpasses all understanding. But here's our question now this morning, right? How do we bolster this peace and preserve this peace? Well, we have the defensive scheme. We know how to guard our hearts and minds, the peace of God. But what about the offensive scheme? How can we proactively and aggressively pursue more peace, this peace that surpasses all understanding? Well, let's read here, Philippians 4 and verse 8. Paul writes, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, 
whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, consider these things. The things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Would you please join me as we ask the Lord to unpack this verse for us. Father, we need your help desperately to be able to think about the things that most honor you and to be able to practice those things that do the same. So please be our help, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here's our main idea if you're taking notes. Philippians 4, 8 through 9, Paul tells us that Christ-like character and Christ-like conduct begins by thinking Christ-honoring thoughts. Let me say it again. Christ-like character and Christ-like conduct begins by thinking Christ-honoring thoughts. You see, the Apostle Paul, as he writes, he wants our minds to be so controlled and so shaped by godly thinking that godly actions abound to the glory of God. I can say it this way, that thinking right thoughts leads to right actions. And that's what Paul says in these two verses. And so our outline is real simple. We're first in verse 8 going to consider the character, the character to consider, and in verse 9, the conduct to carry out. The character to consider and the conduct to carry out. Look there again at verse 8. Paul begins with, finally, brothers. And it's somewhat humorous because Paul has already said finally, but this is his finally, finally. He's already said finally in 3.1, but now he begins to close his letter with this final exhortation. And he addresses the brothers. And that's every Christian, young and old, male and female, new or seasoned. This is for all of us. And what he's about to say here is really just a reiteration of what he's been saying throughout the whole letter. He wants the church to reflect Jesus. And in order to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, in order for us to imitate a Christ-like life, we have to have a Christ-like mind, which means we need to think like Christ. When we think like Christ, we talk like Christ. And when our minds and mouths resemble Christ, our manner of life resembles him too. And so Paul is going to tell us how he wants us to think and how we need to practice certain things in our own life. Now look there at the last phrase of verse 8. And we begin here because this is the main verb that's leading off. It's consider these things. Now that verb right there is driving the whole verse. Consider these things is what really determines if you are a spiritually stable Christian. And the word there, you can see it for those of you that uh, can read Greek. And this isn't try to try to impress you with the language, but to help you maybe see something that word is logizomai. It's where we get our English word for logic or logarithm or logistics. It's a mathematical term, which means to, to think about, to, to dwell on, to meditate, to fix your thoughts on. You know, I love to play chess, and for chess players, there's something that uh, is called a deep think. It's kind of a calculation where you pause in the middle of a game you don't even have to look at the board. You actually look somewhere else and begin to go into what's called a deep think. And you begin to process in your mind positions and patterns, strategies. That's what Paul is kind of getting at here. This isn't just a casual nod. No, this is a focused, thoughtful, intentional consideration. He says, look, we're to dwell, to think, to ponder, to consider carefully we need to reflect on what is virtuous. And this verb here is also in the present imperative form, which means that it's a command that we're to continually practice. Keep on considering. Keep on calculating, is what Paul is saying. This is a habitual discipline of the mind. He calls us to set our minds continually on specific things. And so Christian... If you want to truly experience the peace of God, you can't put your mind into neutral. There is no such thing as a mental neutral. There's no middle ground. And so now Paul gives us what we should be thinking about. And he does that by providing a long string of adjectives. There's, there's six of them here in the text. And all of them are repeated with the whatever is. 
It's interesting. He could have just said whatever is true, dignified, right, pure, lovely, and so on. But he doesn't do that. He sticks to whatever is before each of the words. And you say, well, why does he do that? Well, because he's not clumping all these things together. He wants us to think about each one individually, specifically, intentionally. He wants us to meditate on each one of these words. Well, what's the first word he begins with? He says, whatever is true. Whatever is true. Don't think about false things. Don't give yourself to lies. But consider those things which correspond to reality. All that is genuine and authentic and faithful. You know, yesterday at um, Jake and Nicole's wedding, I had someone come up to me after the ceremony and they said, hey, I'm just so thankful that as you preached on Ephesians 5 about the wedding and, and the role of men and women and what marriage is, he said, I'm just thankful that you said what the Bible actually says. And he says, you know, where I, where I come from, where I'm at currently, there's all kinds of confusion about a man and a woman and about marriage. And I said, well, that's everywhere really nowadays. But he was so thankful because he just heard the truth. The reason why there's confusion is because people are just ignorant of the truth or they reject the truth or they suppress the truth. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I just want to show you this in verse 18. Oh, how Satan would love for us just to continue suppressing the truth. But here's what Romans 1.18 says. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Look at verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 25. For they exchanged the truth of God for what? A lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, people often wonder why Christians are always opposed to certain things. We're opposed to the propagation of evolution and to gender fluidity and abortion and critical race theory. We, we stand against sex, the sexual revolution and Marxism and world religions and women's right to choose because we oppose error. That's why. Because it's not true. That's why. Because it's false. That's why. We're not opposed to science or philosophy or any other discipline so long as it accords with what is true. Christians love truth. Why? Because God is the ultimate determiner of truth. He is the arbiter of what is true. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is why Paul says in Colossians 3.16 that we are to let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. If you're allowing the word of Christ to richly dwell in you, you are practicing what is true. Ephesians 4.21 says this, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. You see, the epitome of truth is Jesus himself. He, he prayed for us that we would be sanctified in the truth. He said, your word is truth. And since God's word is true, that is who we go to to discover what is true in this world. This is why we sing the songs that we sing. We preach the way that we preach because the more that we meditate and we muse and we think about God's attributes and his actions and his priorities, it produces something in us. It produce, produces the right kind of thinking and the right kind of feeling and the right kind of doing. Psalm 119, 105 says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When we allow the Bible to saturate our thinking, we're able to make wise decisions. But listen, Christian, this past week you have made probably some bad decisions. And the reason why you made bad decisions is because you weren't allowing the Word of God to permeate your mind. Is that true, yes or no? Psalm 119, 
Verse 11, your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not, what? Sin against you. You will continue to sin against God when you are not treasuring the word of God, the truth of God in your hearts. And this is what the media lives for, to tell you lies. And we tell ourselves lies. We believe things that are not true of others. We listen to gossip or slander. And too often we tolerate falsehood when Paul says, no, dwell on what is true. Lying, deceit, none of that should have a part in the Christian's lifestyle. If we allow lies to live among us, we will inevitably live out those lies. And so as Christians, we have allergies, some to peanuts, some to flowers. You should be most allergic to what is false and untrue. Paul says next, not just what is true, but what is dignified. This literally means worthy of respect and honor. Well, we see this word over and over again in the pastorals. It describes deacons. It describes women in 1 Timothy 3. It describes older men in Titus 2. Those who are dignified, noble, worthy of praise. It's used in the book of Proverbs to describe what is good and upright. Paul says that we're to think about those things which are honorable, venerable, esteemed, awe-inspiring. But you know what? Sadly, you're not going to you're not going to hear those kind of words in rap songs. You're not going to see that dramatized on Netflix. It's because the world loves to not only feed us lies, but feed on man's lust for what is dishonorable and shameful and ignoble. We live in a day where people celebrate and they get together and they parade and they march down and they chant and they cheer for things that are so dishonorable in God's eyes. But listen, the Bible tells us the peace of God doesn't dwell with perverted things. And Paul says this, avoid frivolousness, avoid things that are trivial, avoid things that are debased. Rather than running your mind through the gutter, Paul says, lift up your eyes to what is lofty and beautiful and pure and dignified. Because the more that we set our minds on those things, the more that those things come out of our life. Not only are we to turn away from all that is untrue and undignified, but we're also called to turn away from what is unjust. Look at what Paul says next here. He says, whatever is right. And that word is the word where we get our word justification. This is anything that is in accordance with justice, what is upright, but it's more than just doing what is right in a cultural sense. Because the world's definition is much different than the word's definition. What is right is what is consistent with God's holy standard. I remember watching uh, Inside the NBA. They were talking several years ago about a guy by the name of Gilbert Arenas. Gilbert was an all-star. He was a great player, but he was constantly making foolish decisions. He got caught up in gambling, and I think there were some drug issues, and he even brought a gun into the locker room at one point. And I remember listening to the commentators, and the, one of the guys was saying, yeah, well, you know, he's, he's got suspended, and he's got fined, and he's, he's done this, but he's really just, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. And so the other commentator said, well, how many bad things do you have to do in order to be called a bad guy? Because if we keep saying he's doing this and that's bad and he's doing this and that's bad and he's doing this and that's bad, why are you still calling him a good guy? And I was actually thankful for that perspective. Someone who realized, well, wait a second, what's the standard of what's good? Look, righteousness can only be defined by the one who is perfectly righteous. As with truth and honor, what is right is always defined by God and his character. He is the one who sets the standard of what is right. And the standard is whatever conforms to the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. And so let me ask you, are you thinking in your daily life about those things that are right? Do you find yourself asking this question throughout the day? Is this the right thing for me to be thinking right now? Am I thinking correctly about this? Is this the right way for me to speak? Is this the right attitude for me to have? Is this the right action for me to be doing? 
I think too often we settle for just doing what's expedient, what's comfortable, what's convenient, what's most gratifying, and we're not asking the question, is this the right thing according to God's word? You see, if we focus on what is right, then we're going to live right. But if we focus on what is wrong, we're going to live wrong. We can't focus upon what is wrong and expect that we are going to live a righteous life. So we're to consider whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, but also look there at the text. It says whatever is pure. And that word pure comes from the word where we get our word holy. It's what is whatever morally pure, ethnically pure, that which is untainted, unstained by the world. Back in chapter 1 of verse 17, Paul said that there were some that were actually preaching, and he said this, with impure motives, which means that they just had a twisted and corrupted heart. They were contaminated. But God's desire for the church is that all of us dwell on what is pure, not impure. That means we need to avoid exposing ourselves, listen, to images and information which is impure and improper. Guys, are your thoughts pure? Are they contaminated by sin? Ladies, are your thoughts pure? And listen, I'm not just talking about sexual impurity and looking at things you shouldn't be online. Sexually immoral thoughts will certainly contaminate your thoughts in your life, but also angry thoughts and selfish thoughts, and suspicious thoughts, and greedy thoughts, and complaining thoughts, and discontent thoughts, and discouraged thoughts, and doubtful thoughts, and prideful thoughts, and fear of man thoughts. All of those things, all of those thoughts contaminate the soul and their sin, and they dishonor God. And look, even us, even those that have been regenerated by Christ, even us, we, we struggle in our thinking. Martin Luther said this, you can't prevent a bird from flying over your head, but you can prevent it from making a nest in your hair. The reality is thoughts will pop into your head. You'll see things in images. The question is, what are you doing with them? Are you dwelling on it? Is it tantalizing? Are you entertaining? Are you fantasizing more? Are you saying, no, that, that, that thought that came, I don't like it. I hate it. It's dishonoring to Christ. I want to do away with it. I'm going to fight it with the word of God. That's the mind of a Christian. You don't allow that filth to rest on your brain. And so let me ask you, do you want to live a pure life, Christian? Is that your desire? How pure do you want to be? Because I, I feel like most of us want to be pure. But I'm afraid that we don't want to be pure all the time. I want to be kind of like halfway pure, sometimes pure, Sunday pure, pure enough for mom and dad pure. But the scriptures call us to purity of mind. So consider whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, and whatever Paul says here is lovely. This word, lovely, it, it speaks of that which is pleasing or, or calls forth love. It has a, an outward-facing idea. In other words, it's what love brings. It brings pleasure and it brings delight to others. These are lovely thoughts and lovely conduct that people view and they say, hey, that's endearing, that's amiable, that's charming, that's winsome. Christian, are you fixing your mind on things that are pleasing to God? Do you dwell on things that are attractive to Christ? Do you find yourself saying, there's nothing better for me to be thinking about than this thing right now that I'm thinking about? Let me ask you this. If we can just put an HDMI cable in your head and then just put your thoughts onto the projector what would we see? Let me ask you this. If there were non-believers and we did that, would they see enough about the character of Christ, the beauty of the gospel, 
that they could actually get saved by getting into your brain? Will they hear songs sung, hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs and know enough about the character of Christ that they could repent of their sin? What would happen if we could tap into your thoughts right now? Paul wants us to think about the things that are lovely and beautiful and attractive. In other words, he just wants you to be thinking about Jesus throughout the day. One commentator said, The object of our gaze has either a transforming or a disforming effect, depending on whether the object is treasure or trash. The law of the soul says you become like what you watch. And so listen, what are you setting your eyes on, your mind on? Are they things that are beautiful or things that are ugly and grotesque? I, I was thinking about all the things that I could mention, and I just didn't want to go through a long old list of things. But one of the things that I've struggled with is people who just love gory horror movies murders, filth. I just don't understand that. It makes no sense to me. The Bible says, how can you be thinking about those loathsome things and be pleasing to God? Fix your eyes on Jesus and all the things that point to him and you will find that you will have greater, better, more Christ-likeness. So think about whatever is true, whatever is dignified, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. And he says here, whatever is commendable. Now, if I were to put this Greek word up, you say, hey, that kind of looks familiar. The word is euphema. It's the only time this word appears in the New Testament. But it's a compound word, and it literally means good saying. This is where we get our English word euphemism. The basic idea here is choosing to think and talk and do things that others would view as commendable. That's, that's reputable. That's respectable. It means that we're not dwelling on crude things. We're not dwelling on what's cantankerous. Ephesians 5.4 says this, There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting. Instead, Paul says, you need to give yourself to those things that are praiseworthy. Your translation might say admirable or of good repute. This is especially important of our relationship to others. And so when you think about others, whether it's your spouse, your kids, your parents, your friends, people at church, what are your thoughts like? Are you thinking the best? Are you just dwelling on their shortcomings? Are you dwelling on everything that is wrong with them? Are you wasting your mind power with what's wrong with everybody else? If you're using your mental energy to tear others down, you are wasting precious thought space. And so look, these, these six traits, true, dignified, right, pure, lovely, commendable, these are all things that Paul says we need to be constantly filling our minds with. But then Paul adds two conditional clauses. Look there at the text. Two criteria for making sure these six traits really do glorify God. You see, the peace of God will only guard our hearts and minds when we fix our hearts and minds on what is excellent and worthy of praise but it has to be in accord with God's word. And that's the key distinction here. You see, because I would argue that there are still people in the world who would say, yes, we need to think about what is true. And yet people say, well, what is truth like Pilate? You've heard about the documentary that came out about what is a woman? People can't even answer that question. What is a woman? That's not people who want to believe the truth. But we need to focus on what is true, dignified, right, pure, lovely, and commendable. And the world would say yes, but according to whose definition? The culture might cheer these character qualities, but there has to be a biblical criteria. And so Paul gives us a summation thought here using these two if statements. If there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise... Paul uses this word. Peter uses this word. This, this word excellence means virtue and, and moral excellence. What stands out as supreme according to God? 
What, what results in glory and renown according to God? That is what is excellence. If there's something that's excellent, you realize this, that it is excellent outside of ourselves. And so when Paul says, and those things that are worthy of praise, what Paul is saying is, don't just identify what is excellent, but respond to what is excellent. Because you can see things that are excellent and not respond to it. But Paul wants us to burst forth in praise, to respond emotionally, even physically. So Christian, let me ask you again, how has your thought life been this past week? Have you been influenced by things that are excellent and worthy of praise? Maybe you need to confess some ungodly thoughts. Have you allowed your mind to dwell on things that are false, undignified, things that are wrong, un impure, unlovely, uncommendable, immoral, and unworthy of praise? If that's the case, then honestly answer how your thinking has influenced your actions. If you're thinking about all the wrong things, then you will be acting in all the wrong ways. But now, let's consider what happens when our minds are controlled by Christ. What happens when we're continually thinking about these things, these, these truths and character traits that he describes in verse 8? Those thoughts will turn into actions, verse 9 tells us. And so similar to verse 8, verse 9 is driven by the verb toward the end of the verse, practice these things. Practice what things, Paul? And after listing and presenting these list of attributes to our thought life, he now shows us how our thoughts lead to deeds. So here we go, verse 9. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And I'll be brief here. But you know what this is? This is discipleship. Discipleship our living out the Christian life never originates with us. We're dependent on God's revelation and God's people to communicate this truth and we follow in their pattern. You see, what Paul and the apostles received from the Lord, they passed on to the church. And there's this cycle, this beautiful cycle. We exist today because people were faithful to pass on this truth. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 so you can see this for yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Paul writes there, Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I proclaimed as good news to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I proclaim to you as good news, unless you believe for nothing. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. It's real simple. There, there's, there's no real new message here. We're just preaching the same old good message. Paul says, I'm just simply passing this along. In Galatians 1, verse 11, he says, For I make known to you, brothers, that the gospel which I am proclaiming as good news is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul says, look, I did receive it, but I'm not the originator of anything. So the attention, the glory, the honor doesn't come to me. It comes to Christ who has given me this revelation. And Paul is just passing it on. And our responsibility as believers is to do the same exact thing. To just pass on this truth. To disciple people. To, to, to teach them. To observe all that Christ commanded. And so Paul, he learned, he received, he passed on the truth. And now the question is, why does he add these next two words here? Heard and seen. You say, is, is Paul just kind of getting redundant here? And I think Paul includes these sensory descriptors to communicate the personal nature of the learning and receiving. You see, this just wasn't hearsay. 
what made this so powerful and impactful for the Philippians is they actually saw it in practice. They observed it with their own eyes. In Philippians 1.29, he says, For it has been granted to you for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same struggle which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. You've heard that statement that things are better caught than what? Let me try again. Things are better caught than taught. Philippians 3.17, Brothers, Join in following my example and look to those who walk according to the pattern, the pattern you have in us. Now, interesting, as we keep reading there, he says, for many walk of whom I've often told you and I now tell you even crying as enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their stomach and glory in their shame. And listen to this, they set their thoughts on earthly things. The question to you is, are you finding someone? Are you attaching your hip, hip to hip, with someone who is modeling the right kind of thinking, the right kind of living? 2 Thessalonians 3.7 says this, you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, 2 Timothy 1.13, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.10, now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance. Again, this is why we take membership at our church so seriously. This is why discipleship is not an optional thing, but a necessary thing, an essential thing. Because we can't grow as a church if we're not connected to one another. We can't grow as a church if we don't have people to look up to and, and model after. And you say, well, is this making much of man? Well, no, because we only follow those as they follow who? Christ. And Paul says here, look, if we give our attention to the totality of what the Scriptures communicate and, and how they're modeled for us, and then the promise is the peace of God will be with you. The peace that guards us is always with us because it's tied to the presence of God. The peace of God promises to be with us. The peace of God, when it reigns and guards a mind and a heart, it produces a certain kind of thinking that accords with true peace. And all that to say is, that as we think these kind of thoughts, and as we practice these kind of actions, then God's very own presence will be manifest in our life. You cannot separate our obedience to think and to practice from God's very own presence. John 14, 21 says this, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And then he says this remarkable statement, Jesus does, and I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. The more that you commit to the Word of God, the more that you commit to practicing the Word of God, the more Jesus says, I will come and I will abide with you and I will be with you and I will manifest myself with you and through you to God's glory. One more time. Who are you listening to? Who are you being influenced by? Ralph Waldo Emerson, he famously said, and I'm sure you remember what he said, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. As you think about the thoughts that have dominated your mind this past week, what kind of destiny do you have? I want to just recommend as we close just two things for your reading this week. One of them is this book right here. It's God's Battle Plan for the Mind by David Saxton. It is a Puritan practice of biblical meditation 
This is an excellent book and a good use of your time this week to think about how to meditate and muse on God's Word. The other is a sermon uh, that goes way back, about 200 years. But it's a sermon by Thomas Chalmers called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And in that work, Chalmers, he asks this question. He says, how shall the human heart be freed from the love of this world? And he basically says there's two ways that you can remove worldly affections from your heart and your mind. And he says one is to show that the world is not worthy of your affections. And that ultimately will let you down. And I remember when I was young and got exposed to the gospel. And people said things like, the world will not satisfy you. And the world will only create heartache and pain. And if you love the world and the things of the world, and you'll ultimately go to hell, and hell's a bad place, and you shouldn't go there. Do you want to go there? No, I don't. But that's all that there was. It was just the fear. It was just the warnings. But Piper talks about this, this vase and how we get air out of a vase. You can suction it out the air, but ultimately what's going to happen? It's going to fill back up. Or there's another option. Instead of trying to suck the air and suck the world out of everything, instead, you pour water into the vase. And if it's full of water, life-giving water, truth, the glory of God, beauty, purity, things that are noble, dignified, commendable, then the world stays out. And as water begins to drip, you keep adding the living water that Christ provides. Listen, church. Isaiah 26.3 says this. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The more that you fixate your mind, the more that you direct your eyes to Christ, the more you'll fill your life with those things that are good and true and noble and worthy of consideration. Because everything that Paul has just mentioned in Philippians 4.8, Jesus is the epitome of them all. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so thankful for the way that you reveal your word to us the way that you convict us of our sin, the way that you show us where we fall short. God, we are reminded this morning of our need to not just fight thoughts, not just to stop thinking certain thoughts, but to replace our thoughts. Oh Lord, who is more true? Who is more dignified? Who is more righteous? Who is more pure? Who is more lovely? Who is more commendable? who is more excellent and worthy of praise than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we realize that those things that we think ultimately lead to how we act, and so we want our mind to be saturated with Christ. Lord, be our help. We confess to you that this week we have had filthy thoughts, and we understand that those filthy thoughts do produce a filthy life. Lord, we confess to you that we have, have had fearful thoughts, and those fearful thoughts produce a fearful life. But, oh, Father, how we, your church, your saints, oh, how we want to have godly thoughts and lead a godly life. So, Lord, would you please transform our minds. Help us to constantly be considering the grace and love and truth that you've shown us in your Son. And may you, as Ephesians 4, 23 says, may you renew us in the spirit of our mind. And God, help us, cause us to love you with all of our hearts, soul, and mind. Keep our minds, God, prepared for action, sober in spirit, with our hope firmly fixed completely on the grace that is brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we'll give you thanks for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now we turn our attention to the Lord's table. 
I'd like to call the men forward and we'll pass out the elements in just a bit. But if you would, grab your copy of the scriptures and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's always good to get our eyes on the truth as we come to the Lord's table. And I'm reminded even as we did our ceremony yesterday, that part of the wedding ceremony is uh, the ring and the beauty of what the ring symbolizes, how it's communicating a message, a message of love, a message of faithfulness, a message of commitment. It's covenants. And it is a symbol. But the Lord's table is that. It's a symbol. It's like baptism, but it's not just that. There is a real sense in which when we participate, believers, when we participate in the Lord's table, we're being reminded of so many things. You think all the way back to the fall. You think all the way back to Genesis 3 and God's promise to send a deliverer, the one that will crush the head of the serpents. And you follow all of the Old Testament and think through God's covenant promises to Abraham, to Noah, You think about the new covenant that's promised, that God is going to write His very Word, His eternal Word on our hearts. You walk all the way to the New Testament and you see the forerunner, the proclamation of the Son born to a virgin. And here He is. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus lives a perfect and holy life. All the things we just described, He lives in perfection. And he does that. And he resists every temptation, never giving in to one unholy thought. And he does that for you and me. He doesn't just live a perfect life, but then he goes and dies an excruciating death. He suffers on the cross, not for anything that he deserved, not for anything that he did, but because of every sinful thought that you have had. But he does that out of love for you. He does that because he's passionate about you. He does that because that is the only way to redeem you. And so when we think back to that night where he shares this meal with his disciples, he tells them, this is necessary. I have to go to the cross. My blood has to be shed. But it's shed for you. And it sheds that you could be brought to the Father and that collectively we would be unified. And even though the Lord's Supper is a somber time and a sobering time, it's also a celebratory time because we exult that the Savior didn't stay dead on the cross. He didn't stay dead in the grave, but He rose victoriously. And every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're reminded that Christ is coming back for the church, to take us to glory, where there will be no more goodbyes, no more sin, no more temptation, no more evil thoughts, but we will be with him in perfection where truth reigns. And so as we go to the Lord's table this morning, I want you to do the hard work of confession, and not just confession, but offering up your thanks and praise to recognize that it is true. There is no condemnation that rests over your head if you are in Christ Jesus. But listen, if you are not a Christian, I would encourage you to to just let the elements pass, to not partake. There's a very stern warning from the Scripture to not partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. But I'm not going to just stop there. I'm going to call you to repent and believe. The reality is if you continue to reject Christ, ignore Christ, suppress the truth of Christ, then the promise is that you will suffer the wrath of God. And that is the most terrifying thing in all of the earth. You should not walk out of here thinking it is a small thing. God's word says very clearly that if you reject the only Savior of the world, then there is no salvation. But Christ, even today, is calling you to repent and believe, to trust him, to take of his free gift, to embrace him. And he promises to forgive you of all of your sins, past present, and future, if you would just come to him in faith and repentance. But I'm going to pray. The men will pass out the elements, and we're going to spend about a minute or so 
confessing and giving thanks to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, you have done such a great work on our behalf, and we thank you for the grace and the mercy and the love that was demonstrated in Christ. We pray, Lord, even now as we have an opportunity to reflect and evaluate our thinking and our doing, that we will be open and honest, and that we would realize that we have a mediator, we have a Savior, we have an atonement that has forgiven us of all of our sin. So may we unload all of that on you. And your promise from your word is that we have we confess our sin, that you are faithful and to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.